Questions to the Prime Minister. Alison Thewlis. The Prime Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, today marks 100 years since the birth of Nelson Mandela. I am sure that the whole House will want to join me in paying tribute to his extraordinary life and will agree with me that his message of forgiveness, peace and reconciliation is as relevant today as it ever has been. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Alison Thewlis. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, I am proud to have Nelson Mandela place in my constituency. Yeah. 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 Mr Speaker, there were 934 drug-related deaths in Scotland last year. Each one of those deaths is a tragedy and a preventable one at that. Drug laws are reserved to Westminster. How many more families is the Prime Minister willing to devastate before she will allow Glasgow to get on with the work of building a drug consumption room to save lives? Prime Minister. Can I say to the Honourable Lady that I agree with her that deaths are, that are due to drugs, the, each one of these is a tragedy. And I'm sure every member of this House will have known people in their own constituency who have gone through that terrible suffering uh, when they've lost members of their family. There is no legal framework for the provision of drug consumption rooms in the UK, and we have no plans to introduce them. A range of offences is likely to be committed in the operation of drug consumption rooms. Now, it is for local police force to infor- forces to enforce the law in such circumstances, and we would expect them to do so. But our approach to drugs re- on drugs remains very clear. We must prevent drug use in our communities, support people dependent on drugs through treatment and recovery. Andrea Jenkin. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Could the Prime Minister inform the House at what point it was decided that Brexit means remain? Prime Minister! Can I, can I say to my honourable friend, at absolutely no point, because Brexit continues to mean Brexit. say to my honourable friend, I know that she wants us to talk about the positives of Brexit, and I agree with her. We should be talking about the positive future for this country. I understand she's also criticised me for looking for a solution that is workable. I have to say I disagree with her on that. I think what we need is a a solution that is going to work for the United Kingdom, ensure we leave the European Union, and embrace that bright future that we both agree on. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I too pay tribute to Nelson Mandela's centenary of his birth. The people of South Africa stood up against the most vile injustice of apartheid. Their solidarity and the solidarity of people around the world freed him and and ended the scourge of apartheid. We should pay tribute to all of them on this day. Mr Speaker, people are losing trust in this government. The Transport Secretary the International Trade Secretary and now the Brexit Secretary were all members of the Vote Leave Campaign Committee. The Environment Secretary was the co-chair. They have been referred to the police by the Electoral Commission, having refused to cooperate with the Electoral Commission. Will the Prime Minister guarantee that her Cabinet Ministers will fully cooperate with the police investigation? say to the right honourable gentleman, I actually question the way in which he put his question. He, Mr Speaker, he has made an accusation in this House against members of this House. Order. The question was heard and the Prime Minister's answer must be heard. The Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, the Right Honourable Gentleman has made an accusation in this House against individual members of this House and of the Government, and I suggest that when he stands up, he reflects on whether or not it was correct to do so. The 
the electoral, the electoral Commission is an independent regulator, accountable to Parliament, not to the Government. They have uh, taken steps. They have, as we know, taken steps in relation to the Vote Leave campaign. And I would expect, I would expect that all those involved and required to do so uh, will uh, give the evidence that is, uh, that is required and, give the, uh, res- and respond appropriately to any questions that are raised with them. But I say again to the right honourable gentleman, I think he should stand up, think very carefully about making accusations about individual members and withdraw. Jeremy Corbyn! Uh, order! Order! People can rant from a sedentary position for as long as they like. It won't change the way proceedings are conducted in this session. The Prime Minister's answers will be heard, and the questions from the Right Honourable Gentleman will be heard. And no amount of orchestrated barracking will change that fact this day or any other. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Thank you Mr Speaker. I stated the fact that the Electoral Commission has made that reference. That's what I said. I asked the Prime Minister for a guarantee that her ministers will cooperate with the police on any investigations they may make. That is not judgmental. That is a guarantee they will cooperate. Those, these are serious issues. The current Cabinet ministers were indeed central to the Vote Leave campaign. After two years of dither and delay, the Government has sunk into a mire of chaos and division. The agreement that was supposed to unite the Cabinet led to the Cabinet falling apart within 48 hours. And on Monday, the Government U-turned to make their own White Paper proposals unlawful. Given that the proposals in the White Paper are now obsolete, when will the new White Paper be published? Prime Minister! Can I first of all say to the Right Honourable Gentleman, that what I heard from his first question was that he said that members of the government had failed to cooperate with the Electoral Commission investigation. And and I say to him again, he should withdraw withdraw that. As I say, nobody... There's, it's very important in this country that politicians don't interfere with police investigations and the police are allowed to do their investigation as well. But everyone is innocent and innocent until proven guilty in a court of law. And I say to the right honourable gentleman, he made, I still contend, he made accusations against individual members of this government that were unjustified and he should withdraw them. He came on then to the question of the amendments that the Government accepted in the Customs Bill on Monday night. Let me explain to the House what the position is. When we look at all... Order! 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 We're less than a third of the way through, possibly significantly less than a third of the way through, and people are becoming overexcited. They must calm themselves, and we must hear the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister. Thank you. And I, I, uh, the, uh, the Honourable Lady sitting next to the Leader of the Opposition says this will be interesting. I'm going to go through each of the amendments in turn for the, pur- for the purposes of this House. Amendment, Amendment 72 related to parliamentary scrutiny on plans under Clause 31 to form a customs union with the EU. We are going to leave the customs union with the EU. So we accepted that enhanced parliamentary scrutiny. Amendment 73 related to regulations on the application of VAT in certain circumstances. Such an arrangement is not part of the White Paper and the Chequers Agreement. We were able to accept that too. New Clause 37 was to prevent a customs border down the Irish Sea. That is government policy. And new clause 36 related to reciprocity in accounting for tariffs collected, and that concept is in the White Paper. The Chequers Agreement, the White Paper, are the basis for our negotiation with the European Union, and we've already started those negotiations. Well, Mr Speaker, that's all very interesting, but does, could she explain why the Defence Minister had to rebel against the Government in order to support the Cabinet's position of a few days before? This is a Government in complete chaos. The centrepiece of the White Paper was something called and I, the Facilitated Customs Arrangement. Having spent a week trying to convince their own MPs that this cobbled together mishmash was worth defending, they abandoned it. So what is their plan now for customs? 
Prime Minister. Right, General, gentlemen, is wrong. We have not abandoned the facilitated customs agreement. We're discussing it with the European Union. And Jeremy Corbyn. Is she seriously expecting that 27 member states of the EU are going to establish their own bureaucratic tariff collection infrastructure just to satisfy the war within the Conservative Party in Britain? On Monday evening, the new Brexit Secretary was starting the next round of Brexit negotiations. No wonder he didn't turn up. He doesn't know what he's supposed to be negotiating. Two years on from the referendum, 16 months on from triggering Article 50, isn't the case that the government has no serious negotiating strategy whatsoever? Prime Minister! I say to the right honourable gentleman, he is just plain wrong on his interpretation of what is happening. I have a, a copy of the white paper here. I'm very happy to ensure that he gets a copy after the. Uh, after this pre MQs and is able perhaps to read it and understand what the government is doing and the basis we have. But I say, to the, I say to the Leader of the Opposition, there are indeed differences between us on this issue. I will end free movement. He wants to keep it. Yeah. I want us out of the customs union. He wants us in. Yeah. I want us out of the single market. He wants us yeah. in. Yeah. I want us to sign our own trade deals. He wants to hand them over to Brussels. Yeah. I've ruled out a second referendum. He won't. There's no doubt which one of us is respecting the will of the British people yeah. and delivering on the vote, and it isn't him. Yeah. Mr Speaker, we're 11 days on from the so-called Chequers Agreement and the White Paper didn't even survive contact with the Cabinet or the Tory backbenches and hasn't yet even been discussed with the EU. Mr Speaker, the Brexit White Paper does state, and I quote, the UK is committed to membership of the European Convention on Human Rights. Is the new Brexit Secretary signed up to that? Prime Minister, honourable gentlemen, that we are signed up to that. That was in our manifesto. But can I, can I also say to the right honourable gentleman, he has stood up and asked virtually the same question, and obviously hasn't listened to any of the answers that I've given him. The whole point of this, the point of this, is not that you just read out the question you thought of on Tuesday morning, but you actually listen to the answers that the prime minister gives. He said. He said the Chequers Agreement stands, the White Paper stands. He said we had not even discussed it with the European Union. I think I've told him in at least two, if not three answers, we are already discussing it with the European Union. Jeremy Corbyn! She obviously forgot, Mr Speaker, the question I just asked her, which was about the Brexit Secretary's support or otherwise for the European Convention on Human Rights, because he's on record of saying, I don't support the Human Rights Act and I don't believe in economic and social rights. He is obviously backsliding to keep his job, or that is the new policy of the government. With only three months to go until the final withdrawal agreement, is due to be signed. The Brexit Secretary's resigned, the White Paper's in tatters, the new Brexit Secretary's skipping negotiations, two years of negotiations with themselves, and they wanted to shut down Parliament for five days. They, if, they've even given up on negotiating with each other. Isn't the case, Mr Speaker, that the government is failing to negotiate Brexit, failing to meet the needs of this... Order! 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 No, no, I know what the attempt is, and it's not going to work. The right honourable... Order! The right honourable gentleman will complete his question. He will not be shouted down, not today and not any day. Learn it. It's quite simple. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr Speaker. After two years negotiating with themselves, they then wanted to shut down Parliament five days early. They've even given up on negotiating with each other. Isn't the case that the government is failing to negotiate Brexit, failing to meet the needs of the country because they are too busy, far too busy, fighting each other? Prime Minister! Let me... Uh... Let me tell the right honourable gentleman what I've been doing over the last week. And perhaps let me. <laughs> and, let me and let me also look at what the right honourable gentleman has been doing over the last week. Well, I was agreeing the future of NATO with President Trump.
Calm your Mr. Lewis, you are a very overexcitable denizen of this house. You are not as well behaved as your little baby daughter. The Prime Minister. Well, I was agreeing the future of NATO with President Trump, and right on, he, he was joining a protest march against him. Well, I was delivering. Well, I was delivering a plan for our future trade with the EU. He was delivering a plan to teach children how to go on strike. And well, I, well, I was negotiating our future security relationship with Europe. He was renegotiating the definition of anti-Semitism. He, he protests. I deliver. Be more. Helen Waitley. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 31 member countries of the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance have an agreed definition of anti Semitism. Yeah. Yeah. Does my right honourable friend agree that all political parties should adopt this definition yeah. and its yeah. examples? Without amendments or exactly. omissions. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister. Shame. Can I say to my honourable friend that I agree that all political parties should do just that? The Conservative Party has done that, but sadly the Labour Party does not Shame. agree. Shame. Shame. The Labour Party is trying to redefine anti Semitism to allow people to say that Israel is a racist endeavour. The Chief Rabbi says that what the Labour Party is doing is sending an unprecedented message of contempt for British Jews. Even some of his own MPs are saying this is anti-Semitic. Anti-Semitism is racism. The Labour Party should accept that, the Right Honourable Gentleman should accept that, and we should all sign up, as the Conservative Party has done, to the definition of the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance and all its annexes. We should all welcome the 100th anniversary of the birth of Nelson Mandela. Those of us in Scotland are very proud that the city of Glasgow was the first city in the world to give the freedom of his city to Nelson Mandela, something that he in turn was also proud of. Mr Speaker, this week the Prime Minister caved into her right-wing Brexiteers, undermining her negotiating position with the EU. In her attempt to hold together her fractured party, she's managed to unite the country against this government. Playing fast and loose with her own position makes the UK a laughing stock with our negotiating partners. The Prime Minister has put her narrow party interest before that of the country. It is it not the case that the events of this week make a no deal much more likely? Honourable gentlemen, that as I explained in answers to the uh, uh, questions from the Leader of the Opposition, we are negotiating with the European Union on the basis of the Chequers Agreement and the White Paper. Uh, and that has been conduct- those, ne- those discussions have been started this week and have been continuing uh, this week. But can I say to him also, he talks about putting uh, a political party's interest before that of the country. I think the SNP should really think about what they are doing when they promote the independence of Scotland, which is clearly against the interests of their country. Ian Blackford. Mr Speaker, the reality is that this is a Prime Minister that has lost control of her own party. A Prime Minister who is in office but not in power. A Parliament which is so divided that it simply cannot function. Mr Speaker, to use a good Gaelic word, it is a Burek. We cannot crash out of the EU without a deal. We need to think of the next generation who will pay a price for this folly. They will see lost opportunities and lost jobs. Did the Prime Minister come into Parliament to have this as her legacy? Will she now face up to the reality and extend Article 50? The Prime Minister... Mr. David T.C. Davis. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister's proposals offer a practical and reasoned way to deliver Brexit. Does she agree with me that it's high time that Labour MPs and, yes, some Conservatives stop the fear mongering and get behind their country, support the Prime Minister? 
Minister as she leads us out of the European Union. Can I, can I say to my honourable friend that I know that, that there, are, look, there are strong feelings around the whole House on this issue, but what we need is a deal that's credible, that's workable, that protects jobs, that protects our precious union, and that delivers on the result of the referendum. That's exactly what we're doing with the Chequers Agreement. It allows the UK to leave the European Union to take back control of our money laws and borders. That's what our plans delivers. And as he says, let's work together and deliver for the British people. Rosie Cooper. Thank you, Mr Speaker. If I may, in relation to ongoing matters... This will be her order. This is extremely serious and it will be heard. Rosie Cooper. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In relation to ongoing matters, may I, on a personal note, thank the Prime Minister, thank the Leader of the Opposition and every single member of this House for the kindness they have shown me. I am (coughs) delighted to be in my place to be able to ask the Prime Minister. So, to the question. (laughs) To business. Would the Prime Minister agree that, as part of the Government's attempt to expand capacity in the NHS, that existing sites such as Almskirk Hospital in my constituency, where there would be capacity to build an extra floor, should be prioritised for expansion ahead of building simply a new hospital at a much greater cost and deprive the NHS of the much-needed investment which should go into um, patients and staffing. Yeah. 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 Prime Minister. Can, I, can I first of all say to the Honourable Lady how very, go- very good it is to see her in her place yeah. in this House? And I know from, uh, from the response that is the view that is shared across the whole of this House. Now, she has raised a, an issue uh, of uh, the NHS and Ormskirk Hospital. Obviously, as she will know, we are putting that extra, extra funding into the National Health Service, um, £20 billion a year in real terms by 2023-24. Um, we will have uh, funding available not just to build sites, but, as she says, to improve current and existing facilities across the country. As regards Ormskirk Hospital, I understand that there has been a, a report by the Northern England Clinical Senate that has made proposals around the provision of emergency services there. Uh, No decisions have been made. That is a matter of course for the NHS. But as we look for the long-term plan, what I want the NHS clinicians to do is to come forward with proposals that are the best proposals for patients and to take account of the local interests such as she has raised. Thank you. Chris Phil. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Around the world, Christians are facing a rising tide of persecution and violence. Does the Prime Minister share my concern at this trend and at particular cases like those of Sunil Salim, a Christian man who was beaten to death at a hospital in Lahore in Pakistan, or 33 women in Eritrea who were imprisoned simply for praying? In this country, we quite rightly protect religious freedoms. Will her government step up efforts to get other countries to similarly respect religious freedoms? My Minister. I say to my honourable friend that the government, as a government, we stand with persecuted Christians all over the world and we will continue to support them. Um, I think it's hard to, to comprehend almost today that we still see people being attacked and murdered because of their Christianity. But we must reaffirm our determination to stand up for the freedom of people of all religions and beliefs uh, in, and for them to be able to practice their beliefs in peace and security. I'm very pleased that I've been able to appoint uh, the noble Lord, Lord Ahmed, as the government's special envoy on freedom of religion or uh, belief, and I think we sh- he will be certainly doing what my honourable friend has said, working with other countries to encourage them to recognise the importance of allowing people to have the freedom to practise their religion, to practise their beliefs in peace and security. Dr David Drew. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In view of the fact that schools in the Stroud constituency are telling me that they are forced to use core funding to make up for the additional uh, requirements of special educational needs and that special schools also in the constituency are having to meet considerable re- rising costs. Will the Prime Minister look at the national funding formula with an aim to helping those schools to make sure that they are fully inclusive and that we help those who are most vulnerable because of their special needs? 
Well, can I say to you, Minister, that uh, I have long championed the, the, the need for those children with special needs to be able to be provided for in the setting which is most appropriate for them. For some, that will be in a mainstream school. For some, that will be in a special needs school. Uh, we have, of course, changed the national funding formula to make it a fairer, fairer distribution across the country. Um, I, I recognise the, uh, the the uh, uh, need, as I say, to ensure that those children with special needs are being provided for in the most appropriate setting. Luke Graham. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, the establishment of a spaceport in Scotland will give the UK the capability to launch satellites from British soil for the first time ever. Considering the opportunities presented by space and aerospace, will the Prime Minister meet with me to discuss more investment for Scotland, in particular the Kinross Aerospace Centre in my constituency that is being proposed as part of the Tay Cities deal? Yeah. Minister. First of all, can I, can I thank my honourable friend for raising this issue? It's absolutely right of him to highlight the opportunities that our announcement on spaceports uh, gives us, and we've awarded grants worth £31.5 million to enable satellites to be launched from the UK soil for the first time. Uh, and that's worth a potential £3.8 billion over the next decade to the UK economy. Um, it is the start of a new space age in the UK. It's a huge boost to our world-leading space sector, making the UK a one-stop shop for new satellite services. Uh, can I say to my honourable friend, he has made a bid, put a bid in for his own constituency in relation to this. I'm sure my right honourable friend, the Business Secretary, will be happy to meet him and discuss that. Mrs Sharon Hodgson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, Bunny Hill and Washington Urgent Care Centre in my constituency and Houghton Urgent Care Centre in my neighbouring constituency are under threat of closure by Sunderland CCG. Mr Speaker, it is not good enough for the Prime Minister just to say today that these are simply local decisions, as local people certainly don't want these closures. So what does she say to my constituents who <coughs> rely on these vital urgent care centres and to the staff at Sunderland Royal a &E who are going to have to deal with the aftermath of these closures? Yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister. The, the Honourable Lady, she complains to me that we want decisions to be taken at a local level by the NHS, yeah. but I believe it is absolutely right that decisions are taken at that local level. And when the NHS takes those decisions, the important thing is that they put the interests of patients and the safety of patients and the treatment of patients first. Um, I, she has raised this particular issue, but I continue to believe that it is right not for politicians here to make a decision like that, but for actual clinicians and others working in the National Health yeah. Service. Mr Marcus Jones. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I celebrated the 70th birthday of our NHS with patients and the fabulous staff at the Oakwood uh, Day Mental Health Hospital in Neneaton. Mental health has always been the Cinderella of the NHS. Will my right hon. Friend join me in thanking our uh, doctors and nurses who work in mental health, uh, and will she say what more we can do to improve mental health and what resources that this government will put to it? Prime Minister. Can I first of all join my honourable friend in uh, thanking and commending the work that is done actually by all our dedicated staff in the National Health Service, uh, and they continue to do that wonderful work with and considerable commitment and dedication. Uh, he is right that mental health is important. Mental health has been overlooked for too long. That is why this Government has been putting a focus on uh, mental health. There is more, we have been doing more, but there is more to be done. We are putting more money in. We have announced a new package of measures, um, backed, by, backed by £6 million in funding, which includes rapid access to mental health services and support for children and their whole families uh, where there is a dependent drinker. But spending overall on mental health issues is at record levels and growing, and that's a planned record £11.86 billion for 2017-18, increasing by a further billion by 2020-21. It's right that we put this important focus on mental health, and I thank my honourable friend for raising it. John Woodcock. Thank you. My extraordinary constituents help keep the nation's lights on, they keep us safe by building the Royal yeah. Navy submarines, and they deserve a train service which is worthy of the name. So will the Prime Minister get a personal grip on this fiasco, which just this weekend has seen 170 services cancelled across the Northern Network because there was a World Cup game on? Prime Minister. Can I say to the honourable gentleman that 
like him, I believe that constituents deserve a rail service that does actually provide for them and provide for their needs. And I recognise the problems that have been experienced on Northern and, of course, on Govia Thames Link as well. Um, we have given unprecedented powers to transport for the north and funding to transport for the north. Um, but the issue, that he, the issue that he raises in relation to the World Cup was one that affected other train services as well because of the way many services operate on their requirements for drivers and relying on volunteers to uh, turn up at, uh, at weekends. And I think this experience may very well be one which the trains, uh, train operators will want to look at to ensure that in future they can provide the services that constituents need. Mr. David Davis. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As, as the Prime Minister is aware, the Department for Exiting the European Union carried out a study <laughs> of all of the previous free trade deals that the European Union had done in order to create a free trade deal, a draft free trade deal, which was based solely on European precedent. The Department was, uh, until I left at least, was carrying out a legal text, creating a legal text of such a draft treaty as, a, as one fallback option in the event of uh, uh, in the current negotiation. Would she agree to publish that text when it's complete? Yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister. Can I say two? First of all, first of all, may I say to my right honourable friend, I would like to th uh, take this opportunity to thank him for the work that he did as Secretary of State for exiting the European Union. <laughs> Secondly, as uh, as he knows, we have, uh, we have published the proposals that we have for the trade relationship with the European Union in the future. Of course, as we look through those negotiations, we will be looking to see where the European Union has uh, entered into certain agreements with others in the, uh, in the past. Very often, the European Commission will say X can't be done, only for us to be able to say that X was done with another country, and therefore it's possible for it to be done with us. But what I want to see is not just an amalgam of those free trade agreements, but actually uh, an ambitious plan, which I believe is what we have produced, which will protect jobs in this country, deliver on the referendum result and crucially ensure that we have no hard border between Northern Ireland and Ireland. Dr Alan Whitehead. You, Mr Speaker. The largest apprenticeship provider in Southampton has reported to me recently that since the introduction of the levy-based apprenticeship system, he has suffered a 70% drop in apprenticeships on his books. That accords with other providers' figures in my area and means that hundreds of young people will now not get the apprenticeships they need. What is the Prime Minister doing to get this disastrous levy-based apprenticeship rollout back on the road? Yeah. Prime Minister! What we have seen since the apprenticeship levy was introduced is actually a, a, a change in the numbers of people doing apprenticeships, but actually a, a, an increase in the quality of the apprenticeships that are being undertaken. The Government is now looking at how that levy is operating to ensure that we can do what I want to do, which is ensure that every young person has the opportunity of pursuing the course, be it of education or training, that is right for them and that is going to give them the best start in their life. Keith Simpson. My right honourable friend should be commended for her sang a week ago in dealing with a, a giant ego, somebody who believes that truth is fake news, yeah. uh, leaks continually, and I'm not referring here to the right honourable gentleman for Uxbridge, I'm of course <laughs> referring to President Trump. He has acted in a very bizarre way over intelligence. Mm. I know my right honourable friend has to work with him, but is she not alarmed yeah. at the way in which he refused to challenge President Putin yes. over the Russian activity which resulted mm. recently in the death of a young woman here in Salisbury? Well, Prime Minister, can I say to my honourable friend, I understand that there have been some clarifications, <coughs> excuse me, of some of the um, statements that President Trump made. Um, I think 
I think I did raise the incident in Salisbury, what happened in Salisbury, and the fact that we have seen uh, uh, somebody here in the UK die as a result of contact with a nerve agent. Uh, I did uh, raise that with President Trump. Of course, at the time that we took uh, immediate action after the Salisbury attack, when we had been able to uh, attribute that to Russia, uh, the United States stood alongside us, as did many other nations across the world, and took action against Russia, which showed a united international front that, would, that we gave a very clear message. We will not accept this behaviour. This is not behaviour that Russia can conduct with impunity, and we will continue to act together. Dan Carden. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Carillion forecast an £83 million loss on the new Liverpool Royal Hospital. And now physical cracks exist in the structure's concrete beams. Sixteen months late, over budget, structurally unsound, the answer to my question last week, in her absence, offered no solutions. Will she now take responsibility for finishing and opening the new Royal and guarantee the spiralling costs will not fall to the Hospital Trust, which in reality would cut the budget for patient care in Liverpool for decades to come. Yeah. Minister. Can I say to the Honourable Gentleman, he says that obviously he raised this in my absence last week. As he will know, therefore, we are supporting the Royal Liverpool and Broad Green University Hospitals NHS Trust in the work that they are doing in relation to this. And we do want to see the new hospital built as quickly as possible and uh, so, uh, securing best value for money in doing that. The Government and the Trust are continue to be in active discussions on this uh, with the existing private sector funders to see if there is a way forward to complete the remaining work on the hospital. It has taken longer, due, and this is issues, there were issues that were uncovered during the process, further issues that were uncovered. I think the right way to ensure that we are clear with what we are dealing is the way that we are approaching it. We want to make the right decisions, and it is right that those discussions continue. Steve Baker. Mr Speaker, it is in the national interest that we should have and have implemented contingency plans for the unwanted eventuality of exiting the European Union with nothing agreed. Now that there is collective agreement to accelerate delivery of our plans, will my right honourable friend please give instructions that every communication related to No Deal serves to bolster our negotiating position and re by reinforcing the credibility and the feasibility of those contingency plans. Yeah. Prime Minister. Can I also thank my honourable friend for the work that he was doing in the department and particularly for the work that he was doing in related to this issue. He is absolutely right. We do need to make sure that we have those need no deal preparations in place while we negotiate with the European Union on a deal because we need to ensure that we have made contingency arrangements for uh, every eventuality. Uh, but also, the European Union needs to be in no doubt that we are making those preparations and ensuring that, should that be the outcome, that we are prepared. Alex Cunningham. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My constituent, Andy McLean, arranged to sell his house to an online company, WeBuyAnyHouseQuickly.com. He agreed a price but then sought cut by more than 20 per cent on the day contracts were to be exchanged, and after he had incurred a fortune in deposit, legal and other costs associated with his new house purchase. Will she instruct ministers to bring forward regulations so that people like my constituent can be protected yeah, yeah, yeah. from these kind of rip-off companies yeah, yeah, yeah. and their yeah, yeah. cowboy tactics? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, can, I, can I say to Prime the honourable gentleman that he's raised a very specific issue, and I'm happy to ensure that the ministers responsible will look at the issue that he has raised. Sir Hugo Swire, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr. Speaker, for any minister to be able to do their job uh, relies on them getting impartial sound and honest advice from their civil servants. And when that sacrosanct relationship is broken, there needs to be a full and proper investigation. My right honourable friend will be aware that the Home, of Home Affairs Select Committee have called for the full, open and transparent publication on the Windrush report that Sir Alex Allen commissioned. Would my right honourable friend, therefore, put her stamp of authority as Prime Minister and insist we can get to the bottom of this and see who was told what and when in order that it doesn't look like another cover-up. Prime Minister. My uh, honourable friend, that I, I think it is important, as, and Alex Allen himself has made clear, that it's important that proper consideration is given to the publication of information which involves uh, personal information in relation to individuals. Um, but I know that my right honourable friend, the Home Secretary, is considering this matter very carefully. Mr Nigel Dodds. 
Speaker. Uh, can I commend the work of the charity Shine and SBH Scotland for the work they do in assisting people affected by spina bifida and uh, other conditions uh, like that? Uh, they, public health authorities, uh, scientists, and others, all agree on the need to reduce preg- uh, pregnancies that have neural tube defects uh, by the mandatory fortification of flour with folic acid. USA and other countries do this already. Will she look at bringing the UK into line and introduce this very, very important public health uh, preventative action? Can I, can I say to the right honourable gentleman that he's raised an important issue? He's, and can I join him in commending the work of the charity that he referred to and, and the excellent work that they are doing on this particular issue? Um, we all want mums to be to have healthy pregnancies, and of course there is NHS guidance uh, in relation to the uh, supplements that uh, women planning a pregnancy should take of, of folic acid before conception and indeed onto the twelfth week of pregnancy, and recommend eating more folate rich foods during, during pregnancy. But this is an issue that I think we will continue to, uh, to look at to ensure that the advice and the action that is taken is the absolutely right to ensure that mums to be do have those healthy pregnancies. Anna Subri. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm sure the whole House would join me in congratulating Sir Cliff Richard on his successful action against the BBC, who behaved atrociously in their illegal invasion of his privacy. Would my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, look again now at changing the law so that a suspect is not named by the media, except in exceptional cases, until such time as they're charged. I put forward a private member's bill. I know I'm off the Prime Minister's Christmas card list, but but it's a a bill that commands cross-party and, I think, widespread support. I'm more than happy to call it Cliff's Law, but can she please agree to at least look at it? Because Sir Cliff is not alone and it's not confined to sexual offences. Suspects should not be named by the media until such time as they're charged. Prime Minister! Can I I say to my my right honourable friend, she's obviously raised what is a very important issue. She's raised it in the specific case of Sir Cliff Richards, but as she said, uh, it is the case that this does not just relate to somebody who is well known and in the public eye. This is a difficult issue. It does have to be dealt with sensitively. It is something that I looked at when I was Home Secretary, because there may well be cases where actually the publication of a name enables other victims to come forward and therefore to strengthen the case against an individual. So this is, I I have to say, I think this is not a either you do all of one or all of another. This is an issue for careful judgment. But in exercising that careful judgment, the police have to recognise their responsibilities and the media need to recognise their responsibilities as well. It's good to welcome the Honourable Lady back to the House. Naz Shah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, This Saturday marked the International Day of Remembrance for Victims of Honour Abuse. This Friday marks the second year of the rape and murder of my constituent, Samia Shahid, who was lured to Pakistan. Will we, uh, whilst I thank colleagues in the House for showing solidarity to the hashtag Honour Her campaign today, and in particular the leader of my own party, will the Prime Minister once again reiterate our commitment to eradicate violence against women and girls, but also urge the Pakistani authorities to give justice to Samia Shahid? Two years later, we're still waiting for a trial. <laughs> Uh, well, can I say to the Honourable Lady that I will ensure that the Foreign Office is aware of the particular case and uh, the issue that she has raised in relation to the Pakistani authorities. Um, but I am very happy to reconfirm our absolute commitment to work to eradicate violence against women. And uh, the, the, the term honour violence is such a misnomer. This is, this is a appalling crime of violence against women, and we should all be working to ensure that we eradicate it. Hugh Merriman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Neuroblastoma is an aggressive form of cancer that impacts 100 children each year, most of whom are under five. Thanks to a campaign involving my constituents, the Jeffries families, and many honourable members across this House, NICE have now approved a drug which may extend lives. Tragically, for my five year old constituent, 
Jack Jeffries. This has come too late, and he is now with his family at his bedside undergoing palliative care. For his legacy and for all of those other children who could lead longer lives, can I ask the Prime Minister to ensure that the NHS now uh, commission uh, and use this drug? Can I say to my honourable friend, Minister. That, uh, I, I'm sure the whole House will, will uh, extend our thoughts and prayers to Jack's family at what is, must be a terribly, terribly difficult and tragic time for them. Um, as uh, my honourable friend has indicated, I understand that NICE has recommended the drug that he refers to for use in children. Uh, that was in draft guidance that they recently issued. Uh, I understand the drug is now available across the NHS through the Cancer Drugs Fund, and NICE will be publishing their final guidance in August. And I'm sure the drug will be rolled out swiftly to ensure that as many people as possible are able to benefit from it as swiftly as possible. Three days after she became the proud grandmother of Holly, I call the mother of the house, Harriet Harman. Thank you, Thank you Mr Speaker. Last night's shambles over the vote of the Honourable Member for East Dunbartonshire should put it beyond doubt that pairing is not the answer for MPs having babies. We are elected as MPs to vote in this House, and MPs having babies should not lose that right. Will she give the House the opportunity to vote on the Procedure Committee draft motion on proxy voting for baby leave, with more parliamentary babies in the pipeline, and there is one right here, and more crucial votes coming up? It is time to sort this out. This one is overdue. Okay, say, Minister. First of all, can I say to the Right Honourable Lady that the breaking of the pair uh, was done in error. It was not good enough. It will not be repeated. My Right Honourable Friend, my right honourable friend the Mayor, Member for Great Yarmouth and the Chief Whip have apologised directly to the uh, Member for East Dunbartonshire because we take, we take pairing very seriously and we recognise its value to Parliament and we will continue um, to guarantee a pair for MPs that are currently pregnant or have a newborn baby. But the issue she raises refers also to this question of proxy voting, the report that the Procedure Committee has, has brought out. We are looking very carefully at that issue. We want to ensure that we can facilitate parental leave in this place, but we also obviously have to ensure there is a proper consultation, and we are looking at the interests of individuals, but also at the interests of the whole House. Order. 